Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back to the stage, Michael Casey. Yeah. Now, in the struggle of a centralized versus decentralized internet systems, there's this insidious problem in that algorithms tend to incorporate biases. Right? The, the people that actually develop these things are human beings, they have their own biases, and these things can work their way into algorithms. The risk is that we're really digitally doubling down on some of the pre-existing divisions that exist in society between you know, the ethnic, the racial, the gender divisions. So we're gonna dive into this important topic now with this session and really look into what the crypto industry can do to try to get ahead of it. So we'll first hear a presentation by Professor Mirsa Bharadaran. She's the author of The Color of Money. And then we'll be followed by a discussion led by Tricia Wang, who is the co-founder and director of Cradle. Uh, Mirsa will be joined by Aaron Kohi of One United Bank, Isaiah Jackson, the author of Bitcoin and Black America, and Professor Dawn Song, the founder of Oasis Labs. Uh, Trisha and Mirsa and co, please join us on stage. Um, great. Uh, thank you so much for uh, having me in this space. Um, I want to talk about the racial wealth gap, uh, which is what my uh, research is about. And I want to show the role of credit policies, economic theories, and, and money, and it's all of its forms, um, in creating and perpetuating it, and to explore why it has not abated over time. So the current racial wealth gap in America between black and white families is high. And one of the curious and interesting things about the racial wealth gap is the higher um, in income a black and white family, the larger is the gap between those families, okay? So it is not related to income. Uh, wealth is where a legacy of uh, discrimination, spe specifically in housing and capital formation, affects the present. Wealth is very sticky, it's usually passed down, it's, it's it, uh, tied to where one lives, a neighborhood. And so these gaps aren't closing because they're um, very much historically rooted. Uh, so just to, to get a sense of this, uh, post-Civil War, so in 1865, the total uh, black population in America was about 1% of total wealth. Today it's about 1% to 2%. Okay, so to say that our public policy efforts to eradicate the wealth gap have been a total failure is an understatement. And it is in part some of the myths that we tell that pro prohibit uh, good solutions to these things. Uh, so I wanna tackle two of those myths today uh, that I've done through all of my work in 10 years. I feel like I have two bugaboos that I just keep going at. So the first is that community banking, credit unions, thrifts, these small sort of George Bailey banks are the answer to poverty, okay? They are not. Uh, geographic uh, localism was something that we did for hundreds of years and that's no longer what we're doing. So it has to be uh, digital and uh, national. Um, second is this idea of personal decisions or community decisions that uh, you know, people often think cause the racial wealth gap. Uh, wealth is uh, a national and a, uh, it's, it's very much rooted to the policies that we use for credit and debt. So the history is that you know, in every single moment in American history, when wealth was being created, uh, black families were left out uh, on purpose from those allocations. So I go through, in the book I talk about Reconstruction, I uh, talk about Homestead Act, the FHA loans, and the, and, um, the GI bills. And I'll talk a little bit about that um, in, in a second, but just, you know, one thing about enslavement that I think a lot of people don't understand, the institution of, of slavery was not just a labor extractive regime, okay? Um, the property and man, the human beings held under slavery were also capital. And with any source of capital, it was much more flexible capital um, than were real property or chattel. And um, the, the slave properties were used as collateral 
um, to fund more loans and to sort of leverage uh, a, a broader circulation of that um, credit in the southern economy. So the southern, so that is actually southern currency. The southern currency was literally based on this capital property. So after enslavement, there was this you know era where you know these uh, freedmen were freedmen and women were going from you know uh, slaves to uh, from being capital to becoming capitalists, and that transition was not aided along w by the banking sector. So one of the uh, you know tragic things that I go uh, to talk about in the book is the Freedmen's Bank. The Freedmen's Bank was uh, supposedly there to help uh, black uh, families in joining, sort of accumulating wealth. The bills and notes of the bank were covered with the images of Lincoln and the Union generals. And it turned out that there was no backing from the US government, okay? And the Freedmen Bank went bust. The white manager kind of speculated the, the funds into railroad bonds and lost it. And black families lost half of their wealth. Uh, this is important, you know, we, we, when we don't know history, we tend to repeat it. So this, the, the form of money is really important, what the backing is, how, how trustworthy that institution is. And when you lose a community's trust, it's very hard to get it back. So when the Freedmen's Bank failed, for about 100 years after, I've been, you know, reading these records of bankers saying they, uh, the black community is no longer trusting uh, the, the federal banks, which of course, why would they, right? Had, having had their wealth um, sort of uh, stolen from them by the federal government. Um, the federal government, so I'm gonna skip through this history. The real sort of uh, today, if you're looking at one cause of the racial wealth gap today, you can go back to Reconstruction, we can go back to any point in history, but really it's about the New Deal, right? Um, the New Deal completely restructures banking and credit markets. Between 1933 and 1970, it's this, the creation of the booming middle class, right? Hundreds of thousands of small community banks, credits, thrifts, credit unions, um, were created and it was all sort of backed by the government, subsidized by two uh, different, on two different sides. The, the liabilities of banks are deposits. Those deposits all of a sudden were insured by the FDIC. And the loans, whether it was farm loans, mortgage loans, or GI Bill student loans, were all guaranteed by the federal government. Okay, so this, this was a, a wholly subsidized uh, wealth transfer to those who could get those loans. So you have two workers working in the city. One was paying $50 for a tenement in an overcrowded uh, sort of inner city, and the other was paying $35 on a house that was gaining an equity um, in a suburb. The trick, the, the dark side of this, was that the, the FHA and the HOLC that went around sort of uh, analyzing risk to determine which house did get a loan and which house didn't, used geography to map out risk. So they had four different risk categories. Green was the top, blue was second, yellow was sort of risky, and red was high risk. And so the FHA did not um, lend into those uh, red-lined areas, okay? And, they, and, and the effect of that was that because 99% of mortgages, it's something like 99.6% of mortgages between 1934 and 1970 were FHA guaranteed, what it meant was that those red line areas essentially did not get those guaranteed mortgages. They got contract loans, which are, it's like rent uh, with default, and they got installment loans. So two, like a bifurcated credit system happened. And the, the thing, the reason this is important is that the number one factor that these risk analyses, these, these FHA kind of bureaucrats that went around doing risk, this is pre-FICO score. The number one factor they used, I don't think you can read this, but this is, you can go, uh, on a website that, that has just been assembled on um, richmond.edu, it's called, it's called Mapping Inequality, and you can get the original red line maps of any area. Austin actually didn't have available, I was gonna use Austin, but they didn't have uploaded these maps. So I'm using Atlanta, um, it's an area I'm familiar with, I taught at UGA for a decade. That area that you see in the Atlanta map, I don't know if anyone's from Atlanta, does anyone recognize that area, yeah? So that is where um, more, uh, the Atlanta University, Morehouse, Spelman, the, the big sort of um, black uh, HBCUs um, uh, uh, are in that area. And as you see from even that description, it, it was a single family um, home owned by business people and professors. So that is like the highest grade in the categorizations that the FHA used. But this area was redlined. 
Because if you see that the top thing is inhabitants, right? If you see what, who are the people that live here? And it'll say, you know, black 100%. And then it says infiltration of, right? How close are other people from coming into this area, okay? So you see, you can go across the area. I've looked at LA, you know, it'll say Mexican people and Jewish people, German people live here. It, it was pretty dramatic, but none were discriminated more than uh, black communities. If you had no black people living in that area, but they were close, they would say the threat of infiltration is high, okay? So we were in deep sort of, uh, this was very explicitly laid out in these things. And what the effect was, was that they would have developers, I mean, famously in St. Louis, a developer wanted to get FHA loans for his like white community, and instead, um, and, and didn't because the black community was too close, so he built a five foot wall between the communities to separate them. Um, this then uh, perpetuated uh, through, at first you had sort of, you know, uh, signs. Um, before, before these things were uh, sort of standardized, you had bombs and uh, threats. Uh, there are many cases where a black doctor or lawyer would, you know, move his family into a neighborhood in Chicago or Baltimore, and the mob would come with firebombs and, and uh, guns. And uh, so there were several cases in this. But soon, the sort of genteel uh, uh, lawyers took over and standardized this through racial covenants. So any house, and you can look at your deed, it's still in there. Every house I've had that I bought uh, that was built before 1970 when these things were outlawed has a thing called a racial covenant. And it's a contract that runs with the land, meaning you can't get rid of it through bargaining. It stays with the land. And in all of them, it says, if you look at the bottom, you know, uh, no, no one but a person of white or Caucasian race. Uh, they have different variations of saying them. This is, these are two different ones. The real estate subject to condition uh, rented other than respectable white people down there. That said lot shall not be leased or sold to any person not of the Caucasian race. So they're actually people like me, for example, well, am I Caucasian or am I not Caucasian? I'm from the Middle East. So people, if, if they were like me, they would go to court and plead their case, right? To say, well, on the one hand, look, the Caucasus Mountains are in the Middle East. On the other hand, you're not what we meant, right? So, so these cases went differently, right? Uh, but that's how the parameters of race got developed. One positive uh, thing from this is that um, uh, these policies once certain races were considered white Caucasian, the sort of stigma around them sort of went away within a generation. So the Irish and Italians are a really good example of this. They used to be on those racial maps of hierarchy and IQ. The Irish were less evolved. The Italians were more violent. All of these stigmas attached to race that were always bullshit to begin with, those went away as soon as Irish families and white and uh, you know ca Caucasian families or whatever got to live in the same neighborhood. So the, the reason I'm going through this history is because this this was never fixed. Um, we went to the 19, uh, 1970. The Supreme Court said that you can't enforce these things, um, but you can still zone neighborhoods uh, in a way that keeps out sort of certain types, not by race but by income. And the Supreme Court has said that that's okay. And the reason it's important for this group is if, if you are interested in not being a discriminatory lender, if you're interested in being in money or finance at all, and if you are ignorant of these patterns, this is the topography upon which money and credit and subsidies and debt run. And if you don't understand the topography, you're bound to repeat it. We saw this with the PPP loans, the, all of the, the sort of you know, COVID, the colorblind COVID, hit different communities differently. And so did the AIDS that the government sent through PPP loans. Uh, so this, this pattern, and I follow it um, through the book showing how these communities have attempted um, entrepreneurship, uh, banking, very sophisticated work to get out of this um, sort of topographical, this, this geographical segregation, and it has been very sticky. And that, that is part of the reason that the racial wealth gap is very hard to fix. So it doesn't have to be housing, but it does have to be capital. Um, and I talk about how, what happened in 1968, um, once the, the nation kind of did civil rights and figured out let's not do the discrimination anymore, there was a bill passed in 1968 by Lyndon Johnson that was going to fix this, to affirmatively further the cause of fair housing. 
and then Nixon was elected. There's, there's a cool story in there. I, I probably am out of time, but uh, Nixon's HUD secretary, George Romney, kept trying to push these integration plans and faced you know, white riots in Michigan. And that was the last time uh, any official tried to fix this, despite what we may think. So we've made a ton of progress on a ton of laws, but until the basic racial wealth gap, the capital structure isn't remedied, these harms are gonna continue to perpetuate. And everything else, the school differences, every other noticeable thing you see comes back to where's your neighborhood? Do you have ladders up out of your neighborhood? Who lives there? Do you, are you with professionals? Are you over-policed? Or does your school have resources? So it all kind of ties back in. So I'll, I'll stop and talk more about as the panel decides. Thank you so much, Marissa. That was exactly what we needed to hear, and I'm so excited that we are on the main stage talking about this. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Trisha Wong, and I'm the co-founder and director of the Crypto Research and Design Lab. And the title, the theme of our panel here is, is my algorithm bias? And I think what you brought up is incredibly important, because you talked about the financial history of what's led us up into this moment, where we essentially have a very two-tiered financial system. And what's sped that up is the way that algorithms are being used to now process the very things that you've mentioned, which are mortgages, um, you know, equity, all of these things, right? And so I think what I'm excited by is having all of these great panelists that Michael already introduced is this is something that all, despite the four very different backgrounds of our panelists here, is that all of us, all of you all have asked, is my algorithm biased at some point? Or you've asked us about the products that you are supporting or analyzing. And has anyone ever asked us about the products you're looking at in the audience? Is this algorithm biased or is this thing that I'm doing biased? I see a few share of hands up. This is great. So if you haven't yet, I can promise you by the end of this panel, you will have. And the kind of, you know, we were talking backstage and we we're like, you know what, we're going to be a, be a bit decentralized about our panel. We're going to interrupt each other. Um, it's like as if we've known each other for 10 years and we're going to have an amazing conversation based on what you just said, Marissa. So I want to start off on um, actually going straight to, straight to asking everyone, what were your initial just thoughts running through your mind um, when you were hearing Maris's talk? And then I'm going to jump to you, Aaron, for, for a question. But I want, I want a quick reaction first, because was, that was so much history that we usually are not exposed to, and that I would say our industry can sometimes be short-sighted about, right? Because we are building a newer and better financial system, and not just but maybe an entirely new one, but it's also important to know what are, we, what, what are we building on top of. So I'm curious, what were you all thinking? Yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you so much, Marissa. That was an incredible presentation and such critical data. And thank you to everyone here for being interested in this topic. We're really grateful. Um, it was just really phenomenal. I think what, uh, something that really stood out to me is I had never seen that Confederate dollar before. Mm. Um, and it really sort of just hit home to me how sort of black people have been the financial backbone of this country throughout its entire history. And it's really sort of clear, even in the Confederate South, um, that uh, where our value lied. So that was really interesting. Um, and I think you can hear all of that data and feel like, wow, this world is unfair and it can sort of depress you and upset you. But actually, it made me feel incredibly optimistic um, because it's very clear that uh, black people were very intentionally uh, kept out of, excluded from the financial systems. And yet we've come so far, even despite that uh, exclusion. And I feel like we're right at the precipice of real, uh, true financial inclusion uh, within this country and around the world. And it's, it makes me so excited to think about what will happen when black people, for example, can get easier access to mortgages in a way that is fair. Um, and I think blockchain presents a real opportunity in terms of the transparency to understand how those decisions are made. Um, so it just makes me incredibly optimistic about the, the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and my initial reaction, again, great presentation. Uh, a lot of the statistics I've seen before, but it just is a reminder. The legacy financial system yeah. is terrible. And what we've seen so far is that it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. The equity between people is always skewed. And the first thing I thought when you put the information up there was that, I wonder how many people have seen this before? Yeah. Because honestly, they don't teach financial uh, in school and they don't really give a solution to the problems we've already had. So uh, I'm just glad to be in a space where, like you said, Bitcoin and blockchain, crypto space, we can actually uh, have a chance. And the financial system, we, we don't owe them anything, the legacy system, and it gives us a chance long term to build the generational wealth that we need. So uh, 
great presentation again. And my initial reaction is, man, I was right. <laughs> I know. I was like, please don't stop. Just keep yeah, talking. Show us more of this history. Yeah, pretty shitty more. system. Uh, uh, we got to get. We got to change that yeah. at some point. Amazing. Don, what did yeah. you think? Yeah. Great, great. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, that's what I was going to say. It's a really fantastic work. Thank you. Thank you so much for putting all this together. That's amazing. And right, the statistics really speaks for itself. And when I was looking at this, I was really thinking, wow, yeah, so, so much we need to do. And I'm really glad that being a technologist, really, we need technology to help solve the problems. So I'm really happy to be here that we can actually provide uh, technical solutions, advancing the technology further to really help with the cause, help make uh, the changes. And uh, on the panel, we'll also talk a little bit more about, for example, what OASIS does and so on. So I'm really glad that we are really building the technology to help advance uh, right, the state here. Yeah, so before we get super technical, because Don is the founder of OASIS Protocol, um, who's doing incredible things around privacy and actually solving for decentralization and scalability at the same time. I actually want to jump to Aaron to a question I had in my mind. Because when, when I just thought it was so incredible, Marissa, that you talked about the history of the New, De New Deal. Because in the history books in the US, what we learn about the New Deal and we tell the whole world is that America, we came up with a solution for depression. We came up with this New Deal and we came up with all this capital and then Americans benefited from it. And that was when our economy and our history has continued to just be such an exemplar, <laughs> exemplary example of how do you deal with dips, right? And what I thought was great was that you actually said, you know what, the New Deal didn't benefit everyone, that it was the greatest wealth transfer, but for some people. And some people were able to benefit from it. And then that, if you don't understand the history in the 1930s, then you don't understand what's happening now. So Aaron, how, as, as the VP of digital customers, customer experience of the first black-owned bank and also the largest digital black-owned bank, how are you, as a bank, serving black communities, the very communities that Marissa is saying who have not, did not benefit from the New Deal? What are you doing differently as a bank? This is not even about crypto yet. I just want to first ask, like, what is happening here at the bank? Yeah, absolutely. Great question. So, I, first of all, I appreciate everyone here for not booing me off the stage because <laughs> I know people in crypto, they hate banks, right? So, so I get it. Um, this bank is different, though. You'll yeah, see. We're, we're, we're going to get there. Yeah. <laughs> um, so at One United, we are the largest black-owned bank in the country, and our mission is to close the racial wealth gap. So everything that we do is really focused around enabling black families to build generational wealth. Right, so just having that as our mission and our mission to not be how can we raise revenue and give back as much money to our investors as possible, that's not our aim and that's not our focus. And we consistently put out services that we believe, it's not always about how much money can we bring in, but often about what can we do to serve our community. There's a variety of different ways that we do that. Um, something that Marissa talked about, uh, a lot about is about where, um, how physical location impacts uh, your, financial, uh, your financial experience. At One United, we have branches and offices in some communities that traditional banks would never have touched in Crenshaw, in Compton, uh, in areas within Boston and Miami that there were no financial institutions that, that they didn't want to touch. Now, we're a digital bank, so you know, physical location isn't as important to us anymore, um, but when it comes to our services, we're constantly looking at how can we help uh, people to build. So that may be about uh, second chance uh, checking accounts for people who uh, don't have the credit in order to get a, a traditional checking account. It's about, offer, we offer a service that uh, gives personal loans without a credit check, but instead just based on your relationship with One United. So it's about giving people uh, an opportunity and a chance. Well, and I, another thing I learned is you also do, uh, you also, also front checks, right? So people don't have to go to a check cashing place, which is one of the yes. most you know, exploitive forms of, of financial institutions in the US. Yes, absolutely. So you're doing so much. And so I'm curious, Isaiah, you talk, a, I mean, your whole life's work, you switched from being a, you know, an instructor of computer <laughs> engineering and you were teaching this. And how did you, how, now your life's work is all about promoting generational wealth through Bitcoin. Can, what do you, what do you think when you hear from someone like One United, like Erin in her position, what comes to your mind when you go, okay, like, is, could this be a different way of accumulating generational wealth? And how does that comport with what you're, you know, trying to help everyone understand? Mm -hmm. uh, so the main thing is uh, opportunity, uh, equal opportunity, not necessarily equal outcome. And I think that in the Bitcoin uh, community, crypto community, you have access to new jobs, new positions, new startups, new capital that you can actually use. And I think that the only thing the black community has needed is a chance. Now that we have that, uh, not asking for any handouts. Uh, it's no such thing as a free lunch, and all the free shit we got, you gotta pay for it now. Uh, so 
honestly, that didn't work out. But if you have the opportunity, I think that, um, and what I've worked on for the last 10 years is in Bitcoin and anything else, if you have the opportunity, if you have the access, you have the network, you can actually achieve. And every community is affected by the legacy financial system, as well as inflation right now. Shit, we all broke, actually. I mean, it's almost 9% in yeah. inflation. Uh, so not just black community, but every community that wants to use it and have a circular economy, it's possible now. Uh, and that's all we needed uh, for years. Well, one thing that Michael Casey has talked a lot about, uh, who's the host of Consensus and also the chief content officer of Coindesk, is he you know, is really questioning that, do we have enough diversity in the space, right? Because if we don't have the base coin holders um, and also token holders who are diverse and it's not, if it's, if it's just still too concentrated, mm -hmm. Right, then we actually still don't have a very diverse ecosystem. And so is it possible because are, did the black community or Latino community or immigrant community, is it too late to get into Bitcoin? Are the earliest holders still the same people who benefited from the New Deal and the history that Maris has been talking about, which is primarily white males? Um, or are you saying that there's a chance with all the work that you're doing? Oh yeah, yeah. well, two things there. First. It's very hard to identify the wallets, who owns the wallet. So, but we have seen with media's help that, hey, this is uh, the bros club again. This is you know, just for white males, when in reality, uh, actually, the black community is the uh, most likely to use crypto as far as demographics. So that hasn't been told in media, so people don't understand that. Uh, I do think we have enough diversity. The problem is, do people understand that it is diverse and that it is possible for them? Yeah. That's why we're here talking about it now. Uh, why, why are, why, are black communities so into Bitcoin? Why is it that in the context of what was just been discussed, why are they more trusting of this kind of you know, currency over a fiat, which is government central bank controlled, given what we've just learned? Like, can, mean, you, can you break it down for the audience a yes, bit? Absolutely. Uh, so from what I've seen early on, uh, not very trusting because of, again, the media is a Ponzi scheme. It was uh, rat poison for some people. You know, it's, it's terrible. But what I've seen over the years is that if you take a concept like crypto and you show it to black people just seeing it and they're like, hmm, this is the opposite of what we've been going through, I'll at least give it a try. And I think when COVID hit in 2020 and a lot of people had time to sit home and actually study and look up and, and research the things that have been mm -hmm. put out, that's when we saw a huge uptick as well as in price, but also in um, user base. So I just think that the opportunity was there. Um, so many amazing people in the space were able to jump into the market and then here we are now building. So. So it's about education. Can I add, uh, can yeah. I, I'd love to answer that question as Jump well. In. I think the black community has always been very early adopters of technology. It's not just limited to crypto. So it's not surprising that we would be excited to get into this space. And you asked, OK, but is it too late? Um, and I think uh, at One United, we focus a lot around enabling um, and onboarding people into crypto. So we do a lot of crypto financial literacy training. Um, and even the most, what I consider to be the most usable crypto applications, people really struggle to use. I, I do digital customer experience. That's all about how usable is your piece of technology. And crypto is still at the very early stages. It's hard to, to understand how to utilize a lot of the technology. So I think um, there's still a real opportunity to build really unique applications on top of crypto. Um, and there's still a lot of work to be done to make sure that everybody, um, not just the, the wonderful people in this room who are really engaged and want to study it and get degrees in it and so on, um, but just that the average person can understand how to buy and sell. Well, can, actually, can you just share with the audience one example where you make crypto accessible? Because uh, you have yeah. so many examples where like, the, a bank is actually getting into crypto, but you're yeah. using culture and actually speaking to the creator economy. Yeah. Uh, so can you share? Yeah, share absolutely. About that? Well, um, I think NFTs are really interesting to people. It's really exciting to be at the intersection of art finance and technology. And I think there's a great, uh, a, a lot of wonderful ways that that's being used. At One United, uh, we worked with an incredible um, activist and artist named Adonis, who did a piece uh, about Josephine Baker. It's this beautiful portrait that we helped him to turn into an NFT. And Josephine Baker, I, I, some people are familiar with different parts of her story, but she was uh, the first international pop star in the world, way before Britney Spears, way before the Beatles, anybody else. She was an internationally known superstar, a black woman. Um, and she then, during, when World War II hit, she became a spy. <laughs> she, she was literally given all of the uh, medals of honor uh, because she worked for the French resistance in order to help them to fight against the Nazis. And then after that incredible career and putting her life on the line after being this international pop star, she went back to the US and became a civil rights hero. Um, so it, that's an example of how crypto can be used to tell these incredibly important stories and uh, to inspire uh, the next generation while also 
uh, enabling people, it's a great access point for them to say, hey, I want this wonderful piece of art, so I'm going to learn how to set up a wallet. And once you've set up your wallet, then there's so much more that you can do within right. the crypto space. So you're doing all this stuff, the both of you, getting people involved in using products that are being built on various protocols, in particular Bitcoin uh, for Isaiah. But this is, and you're building, getting people into NFTs. I'm curious, Don, when you hear this then, um, as someone who has designed a protocol, especially in the recent, um, the last few weeks, one of the data points that's come out with a problem in one of the algorithmic design of a protocol was in Terra. And that was the issue, that was a problem with an algorithm, with the way that Anchor was designed and with the way yield was being held and the way people were forced, you know, to the terms of staking, right? And one of the stats that actually came out very recently in The Economist was that the group that was the hardest hit from the recent crash was actually black Americans. And I, don't, I actually don't think the study was comprehensive because it was just very focused on US. I think we would find that it was also many other groups like refugee groups and immigrant groups that also hurt around the world. But in particular data point was that black Americans were the hardest hit from the most recent crash. And this was a problem with algorithmic design. And this is a problem with what the protocol with Terra was you know, pretty much advertising to getting people to invest in their coin. And it seems, this is why I'm curious, as someone, you've talked a lot about responsible design of protocols, responsible, responsibility over data. And this is why you built out Oasis protocol to function in such a way. So I'm curious, what are your thoughts when you hear about what, you know, Isaiah and Aaron talking about, and also Marissa's history, um, and now you have what happened with Terra, what, what is, What's going through your mind, and how is Oasis Protocol de designed differently so they can be responsive to exactly these problems? Uh, thanks. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, that's why I was saying that I'm really excited to be here as a technologist. I think, I mean, these are really important problems to solve, and we really need a next generation technology to help solve these problems and make, uh, make changes, really, to change the world. So, so that's also how essentially the, the vision of Oasis uh, came about, is that we want to build the platform, uh, the next generation platform for Web3, and in particular to enable what we call building a responsible data economy. And also I think really that's, that's the future of blockchain Web3 in general. So we started uh, with blockchain in terms of use cases from DeFi and uh, NFT, uh, GameFi, Metaverse. And I think really the next, the next level is, is the data. It's a data economy. That's really the largest economy uh, in, in the world, in society as well. And also this is where mm, most of the problems are. So the examples that we talked about for this financial inclusion and you know, getting mortgages at different rates, unfair rates, and so on. So all these is a part of data economy. And today, we have a lot of problems in data economies, talking about fairness, talking about privacy, and, and all these. And in order to do that, in order to change how things are done today, that's actually where we need to develop the new next generation technology. In particular, that's what OSIS is doing, is OSIS is the first to combine blockchain and privacy computing to enable this platform of a responsible data okay. economy. Okay, well you have to stop there, because every, almost I can name enough, like so many protocols and layer ones where like, we are also doing the same thing, of like the first and doing like enabling privacy and also data. So like, can you break it down for the audience of like, mm -hmm. how is Oasis different okay. and than all of these other protocols that are still say the same words? Okay, okay, great, great. Yeah, In simple language also, but you can, you can combine both. Like but there's there's okay. very technical okay. people in the audience and also people who are you know, not as deep in the layers of the protocol. Okay, okay. So first of all, we can start from OSIS unique architectural design, and then we can talk about some of the unique uh, capability and use cases that the OSIS supports. Uh, so in terms of the architectural design, OSIS uh, has a unique architectural design, and it's the first to actually uh, enable we call this modern modular architecture, uh, where uh, we separate uh, execution from consensus. So now, actually, now I think more people are talking about this. More protocols are talking about it, including like ETH, uh, Tudao, and so on. But actually, Oasis as um, is actually the first public um, blockchain that actually has this design of separating execution from consensus. So the Oasis architecture design actually has se several layers has a separate consensus layer that only does consensus and has a separate layer uh, called the paradigm layer, it stands for parallel runtime, uh, that's uh, the execution layer. And also, uh, so in this case, some people may have heard about like roll up layer two, 
uh, which is a scaling solution for uh, one protocols. So each pair time in Oasis is a parallel runtime. It's an isolated uh, execution environment, a runtime environment. You can run multiple of these pair times in parallel. And, uh, and then their security is all actually verified through the consensus layer uh, using verifiable computing. So essentially, each pair time uh, on Oasis, you can view it as a native rollup on the consensus layer. So by separating out the executional layer from the consensus layer, how does that actually make a difference in terms of you know, detecting bias ahead of time or improving security uh, That's and a improving great question. privacy, like what actually, how does so, that actually matter for the user or the use case at the end? Right. That's, that's a great question. So first of all, the, uh, the OSIS consensus layer is really simple because it only does consensus. So already this way, you can improve security by just keeping the consensus layer really simple. And also by having multiple, uh, this pair time running at the execution layer, and then only have the consensus layer that's consensus. So this way will actually enable what we call fault isolation and also performance isolation. So for example, with, uh, even with Ethereum, uh, even with uh, the, the, the newer improvement, you can, even if you have a rollup, but the, the main consensus can still get congested because you still have smart contracts running there and then they can still cause the chain to congest and they raise gas fee and so on. Whereas with OSIS, because you have different pair time running at the execution layer, and the consensus layer only does consensus. So then the congestion in one pair time actually doesn't affect the congestion right. in another pair time. So the whole chain actually can still uh, function well and can still and be, be really fast and cheap and so on. Right. So that's why by this truly modern architecture, uh, modular architecture design, and really truly separating execution from consensus and doing this from the beginning uh, with this uh, native support, then you can provide the best security and performance uh, isolation. So before I, I jump to Marissa for just like now her reactions based on our conversation, is I'm just curious then in a practical, uh, how would it actually make a difference for how would it have prevented something like what Terra was designing? How does like the algorithm, the consensus mechanism, and what you're designing, how is it actually more responsible for the kind of use cases that we want to see more of for, for the blockchain, for Web3, that are going to require larger, you know, more scaling, more onboarding? Mm -hmm. How does this actually make a difference for a fairer, more equitable, and safer uh, blockchain deployment? Mm -hmm. Right. So uh, with this architecture design, that's also how we can, so each uh, different pair time, they can actually be very different. For example, we have uh, uh, EVM compatible pair time called Emerald, and, and also you can have other pair times. So one pair time we call it a confidential pair time, where the whole pair time uh, runs inside secure execution environments. So, so in this way, you can have fully like, confidential smart contracts. For example, so when you, this is how we provide the privacy computing, and that's how we natively right. combine blockchain and privacy computing. Right. And now, uh, with this uh, confidential paradigm, you can run different, uh, adapt different uh, applications on a blockchain in a purely uh, privacy preserving, secure, confidential way. So, and then on top of this, we build up a vertical stack, really enable what we call uh, data sovereignty. So with this uh, vertical stack, by combining blockchain and privacy computing, with the ledger, it helps um, essentially keep an immutable mm -hmm. log uh, of users' data rights. And then with the privacy computing, it enables data consumers to utilize users' data, but at the same time to, pro to provide privacy protection and still allow users to make take control of their data. And then with this vertical stack, it, that's how we also enable a truly scalable, privacy-preserving platform to enable this responsible data economy. I think what you just said is can so I, key. Well, well, so oh, can I yes, ask, jump in. Well, I mean, plainly put, um, you're not going to rug pull like Do Kwan. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> Are you, you repeat the question? Well, I was going to say, you're not going to rug pull your project like Do Kwan from Terra Luna. Uh, I mean, so As long as we don't have that, that's perfect. I was just asking. <laughs> So, so we have she said a lot of black people lost money in Terra Luna, so I just wanted to make sure. Wait, Isaiah, what did you say? I actually can't even hear. Is she were going to rug pool like Doquan? Oh. So, no, I'm talking, so we are actually building up this, uh, this Beautiful. Platform. That's, all, that's all I wanted to know. We, <laughs> we work together. That's right. So, I, <laughs> I, mean, I just want to make sure people know. I, all right, I'm on. curious then, like, Isaiah, when you just brought, brought that up, is that it, it actually gets back to the importance of why I wanted to come back to Marissa to have a reaction to this, because if, if, Essentially, in the past, it was like bodies were being used as collateral, right, for, for essentially 
like wealth accumulation. And now Web3 is all about data and having sovereign data. That actually is a new form of collateral. But for Web3 to pop properly work, we need to have as individuals ownership of our data so that we can have data sovereignty, which is what you're just talking about, which is what I, Isaiah, you were pushing on about. So I'm curious, then Marisol, what is your reaction? Because I, I don't even want to ask you, like, I hate when people are like, are you like pro-Bitcoin or pro-crypto or not? As some are not going to go there. But I really just want to know, like, how, how, after giving this talk, like, what do you think about in terms of discussion of the possibility of blockchain enabled technology to resolve and address some of the issues, the historical issues that are happening right now that you, you um, okay. brought up? So let me, uh, let me say two, one thing about discrimination. There's two, there's two different things that we often get mixed up together. I've, I've been involved in a lot of policy, especially post subprime crisis. So the subprime crisis, um, you know, 53% of black wealth was lost during the subprime crisis. It turned out that the banks went to those communities first and gave them the worst types of loans. So there's two things going on, and the policymakers in, in the remedy mix those up. One is just like outright discrimination, right? Like Wells Fargo was like, we're going to go to that neighborhood because that's where black and brown people are, and we're going to give them those loans, and the yield spread premiums, they incentivize that. The other is like the systemic material conditions. When you start out with such a drastic gap, those things self-perpetuate. So when you said there's a crash and black communities are hit harder, it's not a conspiracy. That's always how it's gonna be. When you have a virus, black communities are gonna get harder. Uh, when there's an environmental disaster, when there's a flood, when there's a storm, when there's a benefit, when there's a subsidy, anything, it's going to come. So I focus on that systemic topography. Look at the dollars, look at the capital, where has it migrated and why? And how institutionally can that be fixed? So I think on this side, on the discrimination side, I think diversity, representation, and getting bias out of the algorithm is really important to just like not have like two equally positioned borrowers where you're discriminating against one and not the other because that happens, right? Or like housing assessments, right? If you go to a person's home and they have black pictures, that's gonna come down like $150,000 less than a home with white pictures. That's just subconscious bias. So I think crypto, blockchain, fintech, anything that takes away those mental shortcuts that we have as like humans brought up in a racist sort of society, that's gonna, that's gonna help. The systemic one, I think we just have to be very careful about understanding what that comes from and how to fix that history, right? If, Absolutely. if you don't have a house, you know, houses and schools right. and ladders up, there's very little that any institution can do. But, but I think I will say on the legacy banks, they haven't been trying. So the fact that this group is trying, that's, that's a bonus. But I think this is why we need to have conversations like this. And I'm really grateful for how this has been curated because it's very rare that we can have on stage um, such a diversity of also perspectives and experiences. And what's very clear that I think we all uh, can agree on is that algorithms are a clear part of Web3. They have not gone away. They're at all layers, in particular at the protocol layer. And if we don't actually understand what's happening at that layer, any kind of, you know, you can continue to onboard and bring, bring more people on to build products and to use products. But it goes back to if the underlying system, if you don't, you don't understand the mechanisms and the type of consensus mechanism that's being used, then we can end up in lots of unintended consequences. It's ultimately humans who design these protocols at all layers, whether in Web 2 and Web 3. And to wrap it up, I, I think it's just incredible that essentially, Aaron, you, I feel like we had a very hopeful ending from you, which is that you do believe that Web 3 leaves, that we are on a pres precipice of something. We are on stage here, you know, with such great representation um, in ways that never were possible before Web 2 or all of the hundreds of years prior to this. And Isaiah, I think what you said, which is so important, was that all you're saying is that not just black communities, but every community that's been left out just needs a chance. And Web3 offers that chance because we are at the beginning of this conversation. We're at the precipice where we weren't there before. And Don, as you said, here is having protocol designers like you mm -hmm. creating these kind of startups or actually thinking about responsible data economy for sovereign data from the very beginning embedded into you know, the actual consent layer, and now you're saying execution layer, and how we do that paradigm roll up is so key, because that's actually going to be the, I think, the beginning of people like us in this room, in this community, actually solving and addressing the things that Marissa, you're saying. And it sounds like you're a bit hopeful from this conversation that some of these things could be addressing, you know, the, some systemic policies without, without saying that technology is the solution. So it sounds like, I think you know, we're at a pivot hope. point just in our society. If you read the book, you can see the pivot point, reconstruction, civil rights. I think we're at another pivot point 
point that these conversations are happening. I worry in the way that the last two turned out. So, you know, I mean, uh, but well, I am very hopeful. Well, Let's hey, build this well, together. If web three doesn't work, we can just go ahead and jump to web five. <laughs> yes, yes, web five next year, to the, 2023. And thank you so much, Aaron and Isaiah and Don and Meritza for this incredible panel. And 2023, web, you know, web five, Isaiah, you'll be moderating. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you so much.